Hello! This evening we're going to take a look at radio navigation in the TBM850. This is the Black Square TBM850 that was released last week in Flight Simulator. The reason we're looking at it is in the options within the loadout of the aircraft there's these two switches on the panel. You can choose the, the primary instruments, but you can choose the KX155 on COM2 and it gives you if you choose the KX155, it gives you this KNS80 um, RNAV computer. And we're going to have a look and see what it does. So we'll go and switch COM1 over to the KX155 kit as well, which just gives us the basic KX155 radios. So it's interesting actually that this is labelled as KX155. I think that might be a slight mistake. But whether this means this all came as a kit originally, I'm not sure. But we're really interested in the KNS80 nav computer, and it's really fascinating what it can do. So, we'll get the aeroplane fired up first, and then we'll have a talk about it. So, let's go and pop the yoke off while we do this. Just go and check my controls are in the correct places. They are. So, let's try and remember how we set, start up the 850 by hand. So, the... Uh, generator can go to main, battery can go to bat, or power source can go to bat I should say. Ignition can go to auto, we don't touch the starter yet. We can go and put the nav light on and then down in the cockpit we're going to go to the fuel system and go and turn the auxiliary boost pump to automatic, put the fuel selector to automatic and then we should be able to go straight back overhead and start the engine up. So just wait for the starter to happen, clear the cautions, turn the inertial separator on while we're here. So we're now waiting for 13% on the NG, so it's just going through 10% and that's about 13. At 13% you can advance the fuel condition to low idle. Then we wait for it to get to 50%. When it gets to 50% we can switch off the starter and then go for high idle. So we're just waiting for the needle to get up to 50% there. Then overhead, turn the starter off, come back down and go for a high idle. We can also go and advance the propeller. Actually, I should ought to do that with my controls. And I appear to have moved the flap lever by accident there, but that's fine. We can actually put the flaps into takeoff, which is fine. Okay, so then we can go and put the bleed on auto, put the air conditioning on. We can go and turn on the radio master switch. The autopilot master power can come on. The pitot heat can come on. We're going to take off very shortly and put the EFIS screens on. And autopilot still going through its test. That's all fine. Make sure the ignition's good. Just double check the auxiliary boost pump's still on auto. That's good. So calibrate the altimeter. So this becomes important in a minute from what we're going to talk about. We're going altitude attitude fail at the moment. That's because I've forgotten to turn the gyros on. So as soon as we do that, we get the attitude. You can see the um, standby attitude indicator is bursting into life over there. Okay. So we can go. Let's just turn the pitot heats off while we're talking. We'll put them back on before we fly, but we're all good. Right, we're going to go have a talk. So, we are at Wickham Air Park. We have a radio beacon nearby the Bovingdon VOR station. So Wickham Air Park doesn't have um, a localizer or glide slope. It has no ILS facilities at all for guidance into the runway. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, what if we could pretend there was a, a radio beacon at Wickham? So that's what this um, KNS-80 navigation computer can do for us. So we are going to measure a distance from the VOR to the edge of the runway at Wickham. So it's 11.6 miles, 233 degrees. Okay, so we go over to the KNS 80 and we have a look. The frequency we want for that VOR is 113.75. So 
So we want 11375. So this is where it gets important. You'll notice there is a data button here. This switches this display between frequency, radial and distance. So as long as we are in RNAV mode, it will be, a will be able to displace the VOR as far as the aeroplane is concerned. So notice you also have en route and approach mode. So if we press this, it will flick between them. So approach becomes more accurate, basically. So en route is less accurate, but a wider range. You also get the display button. So if we click it, you'll see the frequencies have changed. You're allowed to have four different frequencies in, or different sets of data in play, and it just cycles through them. So we're just using number one. And obviously you can say, you can use whichever one you want, and we've only got one set up. So that's, it's just saying use number one. So we've set up the frequency. Then we press it again, it goes to radial on 233 degrees, that was correct, isn't it? Yeah, 233 is still is the correct radial. You can see I've been playing with it, because it remembers this stuff. And 11.6 for the distance, so we're all good. Okay, so we've got the numbers. To be on, uh, you need to see how to do that, actually. So you can see, I can go through the numbers, That's, this is good that this has happened. So you can do 10 and then 11. How do I get the 0.6? I press the knob in, or pull it out, sorry. And then that lets me do the, the 0.6. Okay, so I've got that tuned in there and it's in RNAV mode. If I press VOR, it will just behave like a normal VOR. Yeah, so if we show the frequency, it will just reflect it on the HSI. So to get the HSI to reflect what this is showing, not what nav1 or nav2 is showing we need to press the nav button over on the hsi so if we press it it goes to vor2 if we press it again it goes to gps if we press it again it goes to rnav and it's suddenly reflecting what this is doing so this is saying we're pretending to have the 113.70 vor at 230 degree 33 degrees from its actual location 11.6 miles from its actual location. So we can also help ourselves if we go and look at Wickham, we can see the runway is at 242 degrees. So let's go and set our course on the HSI to 242 degrees. So we're just spinning around the course. Now this isn't making any sense yet because it hasn't got a signal. Yeah, we're just out of range below the tree line, I guess, of seeing the VOR. So let's go and take off, and then it will hopefully make some sense. We'll also go and move that heading bug around to 242 as well. Because then we'll put the aeroplane on autopilot, and then we can have a little play of flying some courses and, you know, headings, and see how we get on. So let's go and turn the Peter Heats back on. And we just got the initial separator and the parking brake to deal with, so there we go. Open the engine up slightly and we'll taxi out. So we're just taxiing out to runway 24 at Wickham. So we're not going to fly the correct pattern at Wickham today. We're just doing an example route just to show you what's going on with the radios. So remember, we have invented a VOR station inside that RNAV computer that is at the end of the runway at Wickham. But you have to remember, though, that the actual VOR is some distance away, so it's not going to be tremendously accurate because we're actually getting further away from the real thing the closer we get to Wickham. You have to keep that in your mind. Okay, so parking brake is off. Let's open the throttle. So full throttle. I just realized while I'm doing this, I didn't put the strobe light on, did I? I could put the landing lights on as well while I'm at it. Okay, so we rotate and gear up. 
and we'll just fly out on the, the normal heading so the initial separator can come off now and put the yoke back on. So we'll just carry on following the heading for a few moments. We can pull the throttle back now. Put the flaps up. Watch the airspeed slowly increase. Okay, so let's just trim that out so we don't have to continue flying it. We'll go for, say, 2,000 feet today at... Actually, we need to go and put the autopilot on first, don't we? Your damper on, heading mode on. And we'll go for 2,000 feet at 1,000 feet a minute. Whoops. Oh, we're nearly there. There we go, 2,000 feet. That's where it's zero down. Okay, so we're flying along in a straight line. And you can see, has this come on yet? 113.75, isn't it? That's why it's not doing it. There we go, 11375, there we go. And the numbers have come up. So we are now 3.3 miles away, 3.4 miles away. Don't take pay, pay too much attention to the airspeed that's being calculated. It invariably gets it very badly wrong because we are operating so far away from the actual VOR. Okay, so let's do a turnaround. So let's go and reverse direction. So 180 degree right turn. So you will notice the course deviation indicator is slipping off to the left. That's because if you imagine we've got this line coming through here, let's, let's draw a line on the map, just a, a reference line through the airport. So we are now turning back and we'll, it's not an exact line, but it's good enough for our purposes. So you can see we've got like a pretend VOR that is where Wickham is. And this distance here, 5.6 miles, let's measure it. Yeah, it's to the beginning of the runway at Wickham. Not to Bovingdon. We've tuned in to Bovingdon, but we've offset its location on RNAV mode in the KNS-80 to be at this distance and radial away from the VOR. How useful is that? So you imagine you're coming into an airfield that doesn't have radio um, navigation tools, but you have got a VOR nearby. You can use it to do precision approaches. So if we had zero visibility, for example, as long as we knew the altitude of the airfield, we can work out the, you know, the glide slope heights at different distances. And then at, you know, sort of 10 miles out, seven miles out, five miles out, you know if you're too high or too low on the glide slope. So you can, you can use your invented distance to the runway, even though the airfield has no radio beacon. So you will notice here, look, notice I said the, the nautical miles, or the, you know, the estimated speed is massively wrong. As we get further away, it will get more accurate. It's got nothing to go on. You see, when you're alongside, it's got nothing to go on in terms of lateral position. And then it gets more and more accurate the further you get away from being parallel with the airfield. And the reason for that is if you think about it, you're at a tangent to the, the angle. So that you have to remember it's being measured from over here. So we're going to cut the speed back, ready to make the turn, to come back again. We'll just go out a few miles this way, and then turn back again. So remember, the airfield was at 500 feet. So we probably want to be about 1,500 feet, don't we, to come in. So let's go back down to uh, 1,500 feet, and come down at 1,000 feet a minute. 
slow the propeller down as we do that. And then we'll begin the turn as well while we're at it. So we're going to turn back now towards the airfield. So we've only had this in on route mode so far in the RNAV computer. We'll try switching it over in a moment to approach mode to see what difference it makes in practical terms. You can see again, look, depending on your orientation to the VOI you're actually using, it can't really work out your airspeed accurately. But it can work out how long and how far away, you know, how long in terms of time and how far away in terms of distance you are. And obviously the HSI is working. So we're off to the right. So let's just open that throttle a little bit. Oh, sorry, open the propeller, I mean, sorry, increase the propeller speed. So we're off to the left. Yeah, so let's go manual. And let's go and chase the the beam, just as we normally would. We'll also go and drop the gear. So we, we can see the runways over here, but we're just watching this to see if it relates to it. But you, you have to remember, as I said earlier, we're actually using a VOR station that's 10 miles away. So the further away we get from it, the less accurate it's going to get. And you have to be mindful of that. You'll probably see the CDI start waving around a little bit. So, and, because, and to combat that, you can switch this into approach mode. And it goes green. So you can see, we're just coming on to the... path so if we watch this carefully we should be exactly on the line in a moment so then obviously once you do get visuals you could be on the, on the way in you could be checking your distance and looking at your altitude and figuring out from you know pre-worked out numbers whether you are too high or too low for a given degree of glide slope okay there goes the flaps So at the moment we are too low according to the Vassy lights down on the airstrip. So we'll keep the nose up for a moment. There we go, one red and one white light on the Vassy lights now. So we can start descending. So let's go and centre our view up. So we're just managing aircraft speed now. Full flaps. Probably a little bit fast. Yeah, it's trying to kick it into the air. This aircraft does have a habit of floating, but it's fine. Just need to be careful. we're down. And of course this aircraft has beta as well so we can reverse the pitch on the propellers and come to a halt very quickly. How cool is that though? So it flaps back up. So using the RNAV computer you can see look we've lost the signal. So once we got below the tree line we lost the signal from Bovingdon. But what a fantastic tool to have in your armory being able to offset a VOR to make a virtual one and then change the HSI to use it to help you approach an airfield that doesn't have a radio beacon. Fantastic. I think it's probably my favourite toy this week in the, in the simulator. It's 
very, very cool. I mean, obviously you can do similar strategies with triangulation, with two VORs if you wanted to. Um, but that's a lot of extra, you know, extra work versus just tuning it in and looking at the HSI on your way in. Obviously you're not going to get a glide slope. But that's like, like I said, it's a bit like RNAV, you're just going to check the numbers. So, you know, if you've already got the numbers on a piece of paper for your altitudes at various distances, you'll know if you're too high or too low by looking at that until you get visuals with the airfield. Right, we'll go and park up. So, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed that. I think that KNS 80 is absolutely wonderful for this, you know, for this very reason. It gives us something else to practice with and to play with in the simulator and to try out at different airfields that don't have radio navigation aids. You could also use it, you know, in valleys and any although you could probably lose um, radio contact with the VOR, you'd have to be very careful about what VORs you use. But anywhere where you know there's no aids and it would be useful to have one you can use it. This has got a great turning circle, hasn't it? He says as he completely messes up that turn. Okay, so how do we get this thing s turned off? So engine can come off if I can click that accurately. The propeller condition can come back. We can turn off the pitot heats. We can turn off the auxiliary boost pump. We can turn off or turn the fuel selectors back to manual. The ignition system can go off completely and the gyros can come back off. I'm being careful about doing this these days because flight simulator or certainly this aircraft does remember the state of switches, so I'm putting them back in the state I would like to find them. So there goes the uh, radio master and the autopilot. Let's turn the EFIS display off and cancel the alerts. I think we're good to go. So flaps were up already. So then we can just pull the, the crash bar, as they call it, which switches off the generator and the master power switches. So there we go. So there we go. That was the, the KNS 80. Hopefully you like that. And I'll see you again soon.